Funding for To the Contrary provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, the Colcom Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. There's a good understanding in Congress about the needs of working women, and we provide research, data, policy, convenings. We still, in 1920, we were the leading voice for women in the workforce and what we need, and I believe that's still true today. Hello and welcome to To the Contrary. I'm Bonnie Urbe. This week, a conversation with Lori Todd Smith. President Trump appointed Dr. Todd Smith as the director of the Women's Bureau at the Department of Labor. She worked previously in the Mississippi State Government and as a researcher at Mississippi State University. Welcome to you. Thank, Thank you, you for joining us. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thanks. So for people who don't know what the Women's Bureau is, please tell them, what, what's your mission? Well, the Women's Bureau was formed in 1920, 100 years ago, as a way to help represent what women needed in the workforce. They were formed two months before women had the right to vote, and initially we helped, the Women's Bureau helped convey to Congress uh, information about their new constituents. That went on to, uh, we then went on to help uh, business and industry understand the needs of working women. So ultimately our, our mission is to help represent working women, pathways into the workforce, pathways back out of the workforce, and, and ways we can help uh, remove barriers to help women transition. Have you gone over the original laws that were passed uh, at the behest of the Women's Bureau? Because I'm thinking in the 1920s, it may really have been those kinds of laws that were supposed to protect women, but really hurt women. Well, I've been reviewing a lot of information, historical information, especially with this being our centennial year. And I know that in 1920, only 20% 20 of women worked, whereas today it's close to 50%. And so the needs of working women were quite different at that point in time, and we've made tremendous progress and accomplishments over that period of time. But, but yes, one thing that I found was really interesting is that in 1920, the very first director was also focused on something that we're trying to help working women with today, and that's child care. Uh, women in 1920, if you're trying to go back to work, you certainly have obstacles of who's gonna help take care of your children. And today we still struggle with quality and access to quality child care. So we've come a long way, and in some areas we're still working to make improvements. Now please tell the audience about your background, your credentials. Well, my background is interesting. I, I usually start with telling people that I'm a preschool teacher at heart. That's where I started my career in teaching young children. I've taught elementary school. I've taught college and been a professor. And then went on to do research in early childhood education and then moved into the policy world. I've served as Governor Bryant's education and workforce policy advisor for the last eight years. So it's been very interesting to apply my background in, in teaching to now into policy making and now in representing women's issues in the workforce. So uh, I believe all education is workforce development. So it's, uh, I, I'm very honored to be in this role and use that experience here. What were you able to get done in the Mississippi State Government? What policies about education did you see come into reality that you were the first to advise the, the governor uh, to put forward? Well, one that I'm most proud of is something called the Literacy-Based Promotion Act. We knew that in 2012, only 48% of Mississippi's third grade students were reading proficiently. So we drafted a bill called the Literacy-Based Promotion Act and based, uh, it was actually based on Florida's law that's similar. But what we built in were additional screenings for children. We retrained every kindergarten through third grade teacher in the state of Mississippi on the science of teaching reading. And we uh, helped uh, provide information to parents about the importance of reading. And I'm really proud to tell you right now that Mississippi is number one in the nation on 
growth in fourth grade reading scores for uh, the nation's report card, which is really the only apples to apples comparison of states. So not, I think 86% of our children now pass their reading assessment for third grade. Versus, so, versus how many before uh, Only 48% were passing at the time we started the bill. So, so where does that rank you? Because I know overall Mississippi has a reputation of you know, a really poor public education system. Well, that is no longer. So <laughs> I'm very, very proud to, to talk about the, those data points. We are not 50th or last on any list as it regards to public education. Our uh, graduation rates of our high school students are at the national average for the first time ever in the history uh, of Mississippi. Reading scores are high. Our math scores on NAEP are, are doing quite well for our eighth grade students as well. So Mississippi's really leading the way in a lot of efforts. You have mainly improved scores, I would imagine, in the lower income neighborhoods, which have fewer resources because it's all based on real estate taxes. What did you do to help or change that in Mississippi? Well, one thing we did with the Literacy Based Promotion Act is each year we've put in $15 million in resources and we chose the lowest performing schools in terms of reading to obtain those funds first. And we put reading coaches into the public schools and mostly uh, went into the, the highest poverty areas of the state. And I believe that the idea of using research to inform that policy, using coaches to go into the classroom and role model best practices of teaching reading and that retraining of all the teachers really made a difference. But uh, in Mississippi too, I think identifying children at an earlier age also has made a huge impact because if they got screened the first 30 days of kindergarten, the middle of the year of kindergarten, the last end of kindergarten, so parents were being informed all along the way, three to four times during the year of where their students' progress was. And how are you going to apply that as now the head of the Women's Bureau at the Labor Department? Well, I, I learned a lot through my years in working with Governor Bryant in Mississippi, and I've learned that leadership makes a big difference in terms of policy follow-through. Governor Bryant was such a leader about that bill and about early childhood education. So we've done a lot of work about child care in the state of Mississippi. I feel that's probably my biggest strength coming into this role in, in the Women's Bureau. In December of 19, women made up 50.04% of the workforce. So more women working than ever before. And if we think about working families right now, the White House just held a convening in December on paid family leave and on child care. And the Women's Bureau held listening sessions all across the nation last year finding out from working parents what 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 are the barriers what can we help with so I'd really like to provide my experience in in helping understand the issues of child care affordability quality uh, the Women's Bureau is doing a study right now um, looking at the cost of quality in every county in the United States. And we're the going- The cost of quality. The cost of childcare in every state so that we might be able to fully understand. I think in 33 states right now, the cost of childcare is more than college tuition. So we've got to find a way to help support parents uh, as they more people are working and, and I think at the Women's Bureau we're help elevating that subject and the research on those topics to help working families. Now how do you do that coming into an office where um, just four or five years ago the budget for the Women's Bureau was about 10 million dollars and now it's three? Well actually I think last year's budget was at 13 million. It was recommended at a lower level, but we have maintained a close to $13 million budget. So you've increased it since the Obama years. <sighs> They've increased somewhat. And, uh, How'd you do that? I didn't do that part. But, How'd your uh, predecessor do it? Uh, I believe that, that there's a good understanding in Congress about the needs of working women. And we provide research, data, policy, convenings. We still, in 1920, we were the leading voice for women in the workforce and what we need. And I believe that's still true today. We provide briefings and data and that, that's actually how I had my exposure to the Women's Bureau. The previous director came to Mississippi and held a convening with Ivanka Trump and on child care and I helped 
uh, convene the, the business and industry that came to that event. And all of a sudden, the people in Mississippi uh, that were leading our energy sector were talking about opening child care centers at, at the factory or at manufacturing as a way of retaining more women into the workforce. So I saw it work firsthand, and uh, we continue to do that throughout the state. So it's done at the factories by the corporations that own them? In some cases. Uh, I met with someone in Mississippi with Milwaukee Tools, and he said, you know, women are doing really well on the factory line. I've opened up a health care facility here. He said, do you think if I opened up child care that might help more women be interested in coming to work here? And I said, yeah, let us help you figure that out. So they're in the process of working with the state right now in a partnership to help open child care, not right on the factory floor, but nearby as a way to recruit more women into that, that particular field. Do you ever think there will be a federal uh, paid family leave Bill, the way, for example, California does it, I believe, with uh, unused unemployment insurance monies plus uh, some kind of tax on the workers a and the state contributes to. Um, how, how is that working in California? Have you looked at it? And could it be a model for the federal government? Yes, I think there's 10 states now that are doing paid leave in some capacity. And as you know, the federal, uh, we passed a bill in December, Department of Defense bill, that offers paid 12 weeks of paid family leave to all federal employees. So I federal think- Federal or are you talking, or military? Federal employees, okay. all federal right, employees. Right, right, right. So that's going to be really interesting to watch and grow and see what we can learn. I've read a few studies. Uh, paid leave is fairly new in most states. So I think uh, that it's going to, like any new project, it's going to need to be tweaked and figured out what works. Department of Labor will be gathering data and providing good um, response to Congress on, on ways we can address and look at bills. There's several, I think at least six right now, bills. I think we're really close to getting something passed even more at the federal level to support small business and industry. But uh, right Tell now. Tell me about that. Well, at the Paid Family Leave Summit at the White House, we had many representatives of Congress come and speak about the variations in those bills. So they're all looking at different ways. I don't know which way is the best way to go about it right now, but I know Congress is looking at that. And I, What I, does Ivanka want? I think, Ev I don't speak for Ivanka, but, no, but I mean, what I've heard her talk her, about, right. this is a subject she's heard repeatedly, as have I, over and over again, as a way to help support working families. That's not just a women's issue, it's a working families issue. I was fortunate to be able to stay home a little bit when I first had my daughter, then re-enter the workforce. So I, I think we're all supportive of a of a policy that, that helps support working families. I would love to see uh, the a support for small businesses to be able to do this at least 12 weeks or some flexibility to women to be able to stay home like I was able to do. Uh, I think that's something really helpful. Is the military program full leave, full paid leave? Yes. For 12 weeks? 12 weeks. Because I know initially California was like 50% or 55% of your salary. and women weren't taking it because it wasn't enough, especially low-income women who needed it more than anybody, but they couldn't afford to work for half, to take leave for half the income that right. they had when they were working full-time. That's right. I think the idea is to give 12 weeks of full leave would really be ideal, and how we can help support business and industry as they try to offer that is what the Department of Labor is focused on. Have you spoken to the President about this? I personally have not spoken to him, but have talked with Ivanka and spoke on that White House panel uh, with Congress leaders. So what does I, he want? I, again, don't speak for the President. <laughs> no, but uh, I'm, just, I'm I, wondering if she's told you how he, what he supports in I this area. I think it's fair to say that the president supports job, uh, family friendly policies, and I think this paid leave falls right into that category that, that he spoke about multiple times. And taking the first step for the first time in, in providing paid leave for federal employees is a, is a giant step. They're also very focused on child care under this administration. We've seen double the credit on something called the Child Care Development Block Grant Funds, which is a fund, funding source for working uh, low-income uh, 
families to provide vouchers for child care. And in states like Mississippi, that's a game changer to try to help more families get into job training while their children are attending uh, high quality child care centers. So I, I think it's fair to say that, that this administration is very supportive of paid leave and child care. When they give those vouchers, how, what percentage of child care do those vouchers pay for? Because as you just mentioned, it's more expensive now than college tuition. I think it's based on, there's a lot of factors that go into how much it covers for that particular family and each family has a copay that goes along with it. But the bottom line is that it helps more people that weren't able to work go to work while their child's being cared for. So that's, that's really critical in, in all states for all working families. So if you combine that with paid leave, you're really providing some great supports to families to help cover those expenses. Another pathway that I think fits right into that, that this administration's very focused on and at the Women's Bureau that we are as well, is apprenticeships. We don't typically think about women in apprenticeships, but at the Women's Bureau, we have something called the Women in Non-Traditional Occupation Grants, and we offer grants to states to try to help women move into careers that they might not have thought about in the past. Construction? Um, what? Construction, uh, commercial driver's license. I was just in our regional office in Atlanta last week and I got to meet five women who had benefited from this apprenticeship grant in our state and listening to these women who said that they had no previous experience in construction or commercial driving now having thriving careers in uh, one woman is in the construction field and she said on the side she's now building her own house <laughs> I thought my goodness I think I'd rather go get another PhD than figure out how to drive, you know, build a house. But they were so confident in their skills. Another woman was driving uh, commercially, uh, delivering movie sets for different movies across the country. And so they all talked about how that grant, um, they had been introduced to it at uh, a place called Goodwill Inter Industries in, in Atlanta and how much they were uh, excelling in those fields now. None of them had children as they entered into those apprenticeships, so I asked them, you know, if you had, would that have been possible? And they thought how difficult that would have been for them to do that training. So at the Women's Bureau, we really want to help figure out how to help more women enter into pathways that they might not have considered in the past and help with those child care needs up front so that they can get the help they need. In the State Department, Hillary Clinton, when she was Secretary of State, she tried to make sure that every AID grant that we gave to another to an, a project in another country, that the subcontract a certain percentage of the subcontracts, I believe it was half, would go to women-owned businesses. Are you doing anything about that like that with contractors at the federal government, which, which of course set up billions and billions of dollars worth of contracts that stimulate the U.S. economy? I've read about that and know about it, but I'm not familiar enough to answer on behalf of the Department of Labor exactly what we're doing on that right now. But I do know with our WIOA, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, funds through our Employment and Training Agency, ETA, that we give out uh, many dollars and, and uh, for apprenticeships, and those also can be used for those uh, support services for women's. We give out about at 1.5 million per year, about 4 million over the last few years, uh, to try to uh, raise awareness, find out what what are some innovative ways we can get women on the pathway to apprenticeship. So we have so many job openings right now. My, my teaching background tells me that we've got to reach young women earlier so that they can actually see other women in these types of careers. So in Mississippi, we did um, a publication called Mississippi Works. It was a magazine that went to every eighth grader, 11th and 12th grader with um, lesson plans for the teacher that showed different people, young people in Mississippi in those types of careers to try to spark some interest so we could, um, you know, introduce them to it at an earlier age. But I, I think that's a good pathway for any type of career. It doesn't have to be non-traditional, um, where you can train on the job, you can uh, get good experience, and the employer can also consider hiring you while you're working. So it's a win-win for both parties. Is equal pay in your portfolio? 
We are working on that continuously with Congress. That's something we continue to have conversation with them about and continue to provide data with them. Um, data to them at all times that it's requested. Now, I know how, it's a big How are you doing the data? Because one question, I'm sure you've heard this debate, but there's a big debate over whether how far along women are. Um, some conservative groups like the Independent Women's Forum say, point to the fact that, you know, a 25-year-old PhD female versus male, she's going to make 98 percent of what he makes, so there's not, at that stage anyway, much of a pay gap. On the other hand, um, there's also a debate over uh, whether you count women who work part-time uh, versus men's earnings, and that can skew the data. So how do you deal with those very touchy issues about whether there is a pay gap and how big it is? What, what are your views on those things? I think there's a lot of unknown still about the pay gap and I think there's some studies that are starting to explore the in specific occupations that it happens versus there, there's a lot of variables unknown. I'd like to know more about uh, where the differences lie, why they are there, what are the characteristics and uh, family dynamics that go on that cause the pay gap versus so much what is the pay gap. So, so you don't believe the, the sort of common thread that women make 70 something cents on the dollar uh, versus men and black women make in the 60s or less and Latinas make in the 50 cents or less on the dollar that men do. Those are the, those are the figures and the data put out by the progressive women women's groups. I know there's a pay gap that exists, absolutely I'm aware of that, but I'm more interested from a research perspective of how we can help address the pay gap. So in order to do that, we've got to know more about it. The last study that I read that really dug into that was all the way back in 2007, so it's really time for some, some new data that might be helpful in those areas. And what did it show you? It was just about that there is a gap, but as I said, when, you're, when you look at research, I think it's so interesting to explore more details about why. Well, one thing we know causes pay gap is women taking time off for having children or caring for elderly relatives. And they used to call the, these on-ramp women, meaning they took, you know, they took time off. They were trying to get back into their fields. They had you know, fallen behind in terms of knowledge of technology. They had fallen behind in a lot of things in the time they were out of the workforce. What are you trying to do to help on-ramp moms? We're looking at all the pathways to help women enter and exit and re-enter as women's pathways and careers are very different sometimes than that of men. So if you combine what we've talked about with childcare, you combine that with apprenticeship, combine it with a, a paid family leave policies. We're also looking at military spouses and 92% uh, of which are women and talk about moving and entering and exiting the workforce multiple times. I think military spouses have that occur in their lives multiple times and so we conduct research, we gather data, we provide that to the public, we hold convenings and raise awareness on these topics. I'll be speaking this week with Mrs. Pence in Tampa to a group of military spouses about her work in occupational licensing and trying to share um, information to help a, a military spouse who moves and how to make that uh, licensing process uh, faster for them. And licensing to, as what? The Women's Bureau also came to Mississippi last year, maybe it was the year before, to talk about occupational licensing and I met a woman who had her dental hygienist license. She moved to Mississippi, it was taking a really long time to get that chain um, uh, accepted, recipro reciprocity. And so once she did, she could finally start to work, but this time she was unemployed was a long time. So we were we made changes in Mississippi to help based on what we learned. So that's what Mrs. Pence is also doing, looking at occupational licensing to try to help uh, ex expedite that process. Your budget, as you say, is about $13 million now. How much of that do you give away or are there other, is that just to staff up your agency and run all those surveys or do you give away grants? We give away uh, funds to states to study. I haven't mentioned uh, opioid addiction. We know that that also affects working women and 
uh, working women are also lef less likely to address opioid addiction for fear of losing their children. And so we're trying to study that as well. So we're giving funds out to states to find out how to help women who might have addiction uh, not lose their job and help get them the help they need to recover. Um, but, but does that come out of your $13 yes, million dollar yes, budget? Yes, we're giving. So there's, you, there's no, there are no like block grants that you have any say other than that? Uh, we give, give the, the, the women in apprenticeship and the opioid addiction. Uh, the rest is done in research and uh, staffing and uh, you know the work we do across the United States to try to help promote all the data that we gather. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time here and it's great to hear about everything you're doing to help working women. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's it for this edition. Please follow me on Twitter and visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next week. Funding for To the Contrary provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, the Colcom Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. For a transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at pbs.org forward slash to the contrary. PBS.